Welcome. My name is Jason Kirk and I am the director of the Optical Imaging and Vital Microscopy Corps here at the Baylor College of Medicine. Today we are going to be discussing the basic concepts of confocal microscopy to help prepare you for instrument training. In this video, we'll address three main questions. What is confocal microscopy? How does it work? And why might you want to use this technique? So let's jump right in. The first thing we need to know about confocal microscopy is that for most biological applications, it's a specialized fluorescence imaging technique. You may or may not already have a firm understanding of fluorescence, but in the context of biological research, a confocal microscope is, at its heart, a fluorescence microscope. It relies on the same principles a traditional epifluorescence microscope does to form an image. Understanding fluorescence is critically important to utilizing confocal technology. Let's take a few minutes and review how fluorescence works. Fluorescence is a two-stage process where a fluorescent molecule, or fluorophore, absorbs photons from a particular wavelength of light. This absorption event then triggers the fluorophore to emit photons of light at a longer wavelength than its absorption. So if we were looking at a specimen that had a green fluorophore in it, we could shine some blue light on that specimen and it would cause the fluorophore to emit a green signal when observed by eye. How does this work? When our fluorophore is bombarded by photons of light in the blue wavelength range, it causes the atoms in our fluorophore to go from a ground energy state to an excited energy state. When the fluorophore reaches this excited state, it doesn't spend very much time here and quickly begins to relax back to the ground state. It's during this relaxation process that the magic happens. Excess energy is released as an emission photon. All fluorophores have an ideal range of wavelengths that will excite them as well as a range of wavelengths where the fluorophore nominally emits its emission light. It's important to understand the particular excitation and emission profiles of the individual fluorophores you want to use for your experiments. This information will be critical to configuring your microscope's filtering system to detect the signal from your fluorescence. In this example, when observing this green fluorophore, the majority of our excitation is in the blue range, from 470 to 490 nanometers, and our emission is in the green range, from 510 to 550 nanometers. You'll also notice that the excitation and emission profiles are not absolute. In fact, they are Gaussian in their spectral distribution. So while each fluorophore may have a nominal range of excitation and emission, you can theoretically excite a fluorophore over a very wide range of wavelengths given enough energy from the light source. This is also true of our emission. If your detector is sensitive enough, you can pick up emission signal just about anywhere in the visible spectrum so we need to be careful about how we detect this light. On our microscope, to detect our green fluorescence, we can position a series of filters between a white light source and the objective lens. Filters are often oriented in a simple cube. The intention of these filters is to direct a specific range of excitation wavelengths to the specimen, while simultaneously collecting the ideal range of emission wavelengths back to our detector. When we put this filter cube into place and open the shutter on our white light source, the entirety of the visible spectrum strikes the filter cube. First, the light encounters an excitation filter. This filter is specially coded to only transmit a bandpass of light, a range centered around our fluorophore's nominal excitation. All other wavelengths above and below this range are rejected. In this example, the excitation filter passes between 470 and 490 nanometers. Once this excitation range passes into the filter cube, it strikes a dichroic mirror. A dichroic is a flat piece of plate glass, angled at 45 degrees, that has special coatings on it that reflect wavelengths of light shorter than some designed cutoff wavelength, and transmits wavelengths longer than this cutoff. The cutoff is spectrally positioned somewhere between the nominal excitation and emission bands of the fluorophore. In this example, the dichroic is designed to split at 500 nanometers, so everything shorter than 500 nanometers reflects at a 90 degree angle and goes into the objective and everything longer than 500 nanometers transmits directly through. After this dichroic, our excitation light is focused by the objective onto our specimen. Our green fluorophore goes from a ground state to an excited state, relaxes for a brief period, then emits photons of light in their nominal emission range, which is 510 to 550 nanometers in this example. This longer wavelength emission light is collected by the objective and makes its way back to the dichroic. Now because the range of the signal emitted is longer than 500 nanometers, it will transmit directly through. Once the emission light transmits through the dichroic, it will encounter an emission filter, which much like the excitation filter is a bandpass filter that only allows a certain range of wavelengths to pass. 
In this example, the emission filter transmits between 510 and 550 nanometers and blocks everything outside this range. The emission light is then directed to the eyepieces of the microscope or even to a camera to detect a fluorescence image. Traditional wide-field microscopes are excellent tools for imaging fluorescence, but they have a bit of a problem. The problem is that when the excitation light is focused onto our specimen by the objective, it excites all the fluorescence within our field of view, in all dimensions, with roughly the same efficiency. Microscope objectives have a very small depth of focus, which is the area of the specimen that is in focus at any one time. Fluorescence is emitting from everywhere, especially from areas outside our objective's narrow depth of focus. A wide-field microscope collects all this signal, and the out-of-focus fluorescence component can cause our resulting image to be a bit of a blurred mess. Here is an example image of a 20 micron thick section through the tongue muscles of a rat. Collected by a wide-field microscope, you'll notice that the image is quite blurry, and it's very difficult to see the muscle fibers here that are stained with an Alexa 488 fluorophore against phalloidin. There is hope, however. A confocal microscope can be utilized to manage this problem. In fact, the central purpose for which confocal microscopy is designed is to reduce the blurring effect caused by out-of-focus light interfering with in-focus light. This is the same field of the specimen we just observed with the traditional epifluorescence microscope. This time the image was collected with a confocal. You'll immediately see the reduction of that out-of-focus blurring effect. Compared to a traditional fluorescence microscope, the confocal effect leads to increased contrast, sharpness, and resolution in the image. This effect will even create an optical section from which we can create three-dimensional datasets. Okay, so how do we get a confocal image from our wide-field microscope? A confocal image is created by altering two main aspects of our epifluorescence microscope. The first change is made to our excitation path. Instead of illuminating with a white light source, confocal microscopes utilize lasers for excitation. Lasers are highly collimated light sources that provide tons of power. They are also monochromatic, so we do not need to use a separate excitation filter. Most importantly, however, lasers act as a point source of light, restricting the illumination to a tiny diffraction-limited spot within the field of view. By contrast, a white light source on a wide-field microscope unrestrictedly illuminates everything within the objective's field of view. Here is a look at a real-world example of the illumination cone of a traditional epifluorescence microscope. You'll notice how wide the illumination circle is relative to our 20x objective. When we change our illumination to a point source of laser light, we now have a much more concise and defined illumination volume. The second change we make to our epifluorescence microscope is in our emission path. While we narrowed the illumination to a point source with our excitation laser, there is still a considerable amount of autofocus signal being generated within that tiny spot. Rather than collecting all the fluorescence signal excited by our illumination laser, Confocal microscopes use an adjustable aperture diaphragm, called a pinhole, to physically reject fluorescence emission from planes outside the primary focus plane of the objective. The larger we make this pinhole diameter, the more focal planes will contribute to the image. The smaller we make this diameter, the fewer planes that will contribute to the image. Okay, so let's take a walk back through our beam path to find out how this is all done. On a confocal microscope, our white light source is replaced with a monochromatic laser. This laser acts as a point source of light, and is focused by our objective onto the sample. It is important to re-emphasize here that our illumination laser is only exciting a very small spot within our overall field of view. While our excitation laser is illuminating this tiny spot, our fluorophores within this spot are subsequently generating a point source of emission light. The longer wavelength emission light is then collected by the objective, and makes its way back to the dichroic. Remember that it contains signal from all focal planes within the laser's tiny spot of illumination. A confocal microscope will then take our emission signal after the dichroic and focus it onto a conjugate focal plane close to our detector. A conjugate focal plane is an intermediate image plane that focuses to the same spot as the objective. It's in this conjugate focal plane that we can insert our pinhole. In this schematic, we are looking at the microscope from the side, so the pinhole will appear as a slit. If we close down this diaphragm to the focal point of the lens, we only allow signal from the plane that is in focus for our objective to get through to the detector. But remember that we have signal being collected from focus planes above and below the objective's primary focus. What happens to that signal? When the objective collects signal from above the primary focus plane, 
the majority of the signal will be focused somewhere before the conjugate focal plane. So when the light from this plane reaches the pinhole, it will be defocused and the bulk of the signal is physically rejected by the aperture. The same is true for the signal the objective collects that is below the primary focus plane. This signal will try to focus somewhere behind the conjugate focal plane. So this signal also gets rejected. By adjusting the diameter of this aperture, we can control how much fluorescence signal from outside the objective's focal plane reaches our detector. The smaller the diameter, the fewer the number of out-of-focus planes contribute to our final image. The in-focus planes that do contribute to our image are referred to as our optical section. The thickness of the optical section that is generated by the confocal is calculated by the following formula. I don't need you to completely understand this formula, but pay close attention to the variables that affect the calculation. They are, of course, the pinhole diameter, the numerical aperture of the lens, the wavelength of emission light, and the refractive index of any immersion fluid required by the objective. The diameter of the pinhole directly controls the optical section thickness. The smaller the better, right? Not necessarily. There is a limit to how effective a confocal aperture can be. Setting the pinhole diameter appropriately requires an understanding of not only what is happening to the out-of-focus light, but how the optical system sees light to begin with. Recall that our fluorophore is being illuminated with a point source of laser light. Our fluorophore, which is smaller than our optical system is capable of resolving, is generating a subsequent point source of emission light. An optical lens, such as our objective, sees our point source of light and convolves it into an airy pattern, referred to as the point spread function, or PSF. An airy pattern is an optical description for how a perfect lens sees a focused point source of light. To our microscope, this airy pattern of emission light has a central order containing the bulk of our in-focus fluorescence signal, surrounded by higher orders of light diffracted through the lens. These higher orders contain signal from out-of-focus planes in all dimensions. The airy pattern is focused onto our conjugate focal plane for each point in our specimen. And when we insert our pinhole, we can effectively reject the majority of this out-of-focus light. There are limits to this diameter setting, and those limits are defined by the quantity and quality of the signal that we collect from the fluorescence emission. If we consider a detected point source with our pinhole wide open, we have a state where we are collecting the maximum amount of signal, but we have the worst possible optical section thickness, or Z resolution. As we close down this pinhole, you can see that the Z resolution improves greatly, while the signal level is reducing at a much lower rate, a good compromise. This all changes, however, when the diameter reaches one area unit. When we cross this threshold, our Z resolution continues to improve at roughly the same rate, but now we start to lose signal exponentially. We start losing signal exponentially because below one area unit, this aperture is now cutting into the central order of our area pattern, which contains the bulk of our in-focus fluorescence signal. The diameter of the pinhole is expressed in area units on a confocal microscope. In the software control of a confocal, you will find your optical section thickness calculation accompanied by this area unit calculation. Setting this value to one area unit for your longest wavelength fluorophore is a common compromise value between the signal collected and the resolution of the system. In addition to the pinhole diameter, the numerical aperture, or NA, of the objective lens has the largest influence on overall resolution. The NA is the measure of the light gathering ability of the lens and dictates the resolution limit of the optical section. The higher the NA, the steeper the light collection angle into the objective, creating a tighter airy pattern. Resolution of a lens is measured by the width of the waist of this central airy order at half its maximal intensity. The narrower this waist, the higher the resolution of the lens. The choice of objective lens will control the NA. Here is a diagram of the objectives available on most of the OIVM course confocal microscopes. The first three positions are low magnification, low NA dry objectives at 5, 10, and 20x. The 5 and 10x are typically used for screening samples, and occasionally for imaging larger specimens. The last three positions are high magnification, high NA objectives, for aqueous specimens using water immersion, and for specimens mounted in high refractive index mounting mediums, like prolong or slow fade, using oil immersion. There are a few key pieces of information you need to know to appropriately select an objective lens. The first is what is the size of the structures you are trying to resolve? Are you observing cells interacting with other cells? Or are you interested in things like the dynamics of subcellular organelles? The answer to this question will determine how high of an NAE you require. 
The NA directly influences the resolution of the lens. So take a good look at the numbers on this chart and choose an objective that allows a high enough X, Y, and Z resolution for your experimental needs. Along with the NA, the wavelength of emission light by the fluorophore will play a role in the resolution of the instrument. The shorter the wavelength of light, the higher the resolution. The refractive index of the specimen is also important. Inasmuch as for the best optical resolution, it must closely match the refractive index that the objective is designed to image with. Objectives are designed for imaging in air, water, or high refractive index solutions such as glycerol or oil. Lower resolution optics, typically with an NA of less than 1.0, are most often air optics, so the refractive index of the mounting solution only has minor effects on image quality. High resolution objectives such as oil immersion lenses require specimens to be mounted in a medium that has the same, or as close to the same as possible, refractive index as their intended immersion media which for oil is 1.518. Using an oil immersion objective with a specimen mounted in aqueous media, cell culture media for example, will significantly reduce the performance of the objective as you focus further into the specimen, and this problem will be readily apparent on a confocal microscope. If you require an immersion objective, choose one that closely matches the refractive index of your mounting medium for best results. So that's all great. In theory, we can just insert a pinhole into a conjugate focal plane and take pictures just like we did with our traditional epifluorescence microscope, right? If you just insert a pinhole into a wide field microscope and attempt to visualize the image using point source illumination through the eyepieces, you would only see a tiny spot of fluorescence signal smack dab in the middle of the field of view. And that doesn't make for a very good image. The confocal effect only works on a very small spot, a point source, in our field of view at any one time. So you cannot just image the entire field of view with this aperture in place. So how do we get an image with a confocal then? We have to move that tiny little spot around our field of view to build an image. This is called scanning. Most modern laser scanning confocal microscopes use what is referred to as raster scanning to build an image. An image consists of an array of pixels, arranged in two dimensions, with X along the horizontal axis and Y along the vertical axis. A raster scan is a pattern of movement within this array, where the position of the illumination will start in the upper left-hand corner and move all the way across the x-axis from left to right, then do a carriage return like an old typewriter, and start another x-scan at the next y position. This process is then repeated all the way to the bottom of the y dimension. Rather than scan the pinhole itself, modern confocal microscopes use a pair of galvanometer mirrors, one for x and one for y, positioned between the objective and dichroic mirror to move our excitation laser over the field of view. You'll recall that using the laser as an excitation source is beneficial here because they act as a point source of light, restricting the illumination to a tiny diffraction limited spot that lines up with the tiny spot collected through our pinhole. So while the scan is progressing, areas that are not currently being sampled will not be illuminated. The emission signal collected by the objective will pass through the scanners from the opposite direction on its way to the pinhole and detector. As the emission signal exits the scanners, it becomes stationary, referred to as descanned, which makes it easier to align the emission and pinhole optics in the optical path. As the illumination laser passes over each region, a detector records the amount of fluorescence emission light at each location and then maps that signal as an intensity value to a pixel located in the corresponding region of our final image. The detectors used in confocal microscopes are photomultiplier tubes, or PMTs. Confocals use PMTs because they are extremely fast, non-spatial detectors. PMTs detect emission light by converting photons that strike the detector surface into an analog current. The analog output current is proportional to the number of photons that strike the detector. When a photon of light enters the detector window, it strikes a photocathode. This causes the photocathode material to eject electrons. The photocathode on a PMT is not very efficient, typically ejecting a single electron for every five photons that strike the surface. Those ejected electrons need to be amplified so we can detect them more efficiently. So as they are ejected, they are angled towards a dynode chain, which will amplify the electrons at each stage in the chain. The detectors on most of our confocals in the OIVM core have nine dynode stages. The amplified electrons are then captured by an anode positioned at the end of the dynode chain, which outputs the resulting photoelectron stream to an analog current. In addition to increasing our photoelectrons with a dynode chain, PMTs are also unique 
in that they can have high voltage applied to the detector, which will create significant additional amplification, referred to as gain, to increase the number of photoelectrons sent to our output signal. Gain is a very important feature on a confocal microscope, and we'll talk more about how to use it during instrument training. As a result of the dyno chain and analog voltage adjustments, our signal is now amplified significantly above the noise floor of the detection system. PMTs output this analog signal as a function of time. As the scanner is traveling over the sample, we constantly know its position relative to our starting location in the upper left-hand corner of the image. This starting location is also where the detector begins recording, and based on the velocity and coordinates of the scanners, we can calculate precisely when the detector records the fluorescence signal for each location in the scan. PMTs are collecting and outputting this analog current at a much faster rate than we typically scan, so the electronics of the system will periodically sample this current for the amount of time that the laser spends at each pixel in the scan. This is known as the pixel dwell time. The analog to digital converter electronics perform this sampling function and transform the signal into a discrete, equidistant succession of gray values in the range of the bit depth of the electronics. Each pixel is assigned a gray value in the range of the program depth. That is the intensity of your fluorescence equivalent to the number of photons recorded by the PMT. This data is then output to its corresponding pixel in the image array. Once our 2D image is built, this data has no color information and corresponds to a single fluorophore only. If your experiments require imaging more than one fluorophore, you will need to scan an image for each fluorophore in your specimen. For a three color fluorescence image, three separate image acquisition events are required. It is important that the image data from the individual fluorophore be kept separate for analysis purposes later on. We can gather further information from our specimen by scanning a three dimensional data set. 3D datasets, or Z stacks, are simply 2D scans collected at different focus positions throughout a three dimensional structure. Confocal software can be set up to automatically collect a serial scan in Z by marking the top and bottom focus positions in your sample. The imaging software can then calculate the ideal number of slices to image based on your objective's resolution. Now that we have a solid understanding of how this technology works, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of using confocal microscopy? Imaging experiments that will benefit from confocal microscopy are mainly utilizing specimens that have some inherent three-dimensionality to them. These can be thick sections immutilabled with fluorophores of interest, or even unsectioned hole mounts attempting to preserve the entire three-dimensional nature of the tissue. Point scanning confocal microscopes work well on tissue in both low and high magnification scenarios. For low magnification work, 20x and below with dry optics, Tissue section thicknesses between 30 and 50 microns are ideal. At higher magnifications using immersion optics, tissue sections thicker than 10 microns will benefit greatly from this technology. Visible confocal microscopes can image out to 100 microns or more, depending on the scattering nature of the tissue. More advanced experiments that require localized exposure, such as FRAP or photoactivation time lapses, can take advantage of point source illumination by precisely positioning the laser source. Some confocal microscopes also employ some sophisticated emission collection systems, so experiments requiring the use of fluorophores with heavily overlapping emission, such as GFP and YFP, can be imaged with relative ease. Confocal microscopes do have downsides that should be considered before deciding if it's the right technology for your experiment. The first is that because the image has to be scanned, acquisition can be slow, on the minute time scale. So if you require high-speed imaging, then a point scanning confocal is typically not the first choice. Even with the slow scan speed, an image that is 1024 by 1024 pixels in size will have 1,048,576 pixels to scan. That's a lot of pixels. But each pixel will have a very short exposure, or dwell time, in the microsecond range. This is extremely short which means that in order to see a viable signal, we have to increase our exposure to laser light significantly. This can be somewhat problematic because confocal microscopes aren't the most sensitive instruments compared to other technologies like CCD-based imaging systems. So fragile live specimens or specimens with weak fluorescence, low QE reporters, or fluorophores that bleach quickly can be troublesome to image with a point scanning confocal microscope. Finally, Thin specimens, such as ultra-thin cryosections less than 10 microns thick, 
or specimens such as tissue culture cells will show little improvement in image quality with confocal microscopes compared to wide field, mainly because there really isn't that much out of focus signal to reject. Images collected of these types of specimens on wide field microscopes can be image processed to further improve contrast and resolution, such as with deconvolution software. This is not to say that you won't get any benefit from using a confocal microscope in the case of thin specimens. The advantage to using a point scanning confocal is that for many experiments, it is quite easy to choose a very photostable, bright fluorophore that will overcome many of these limitations. Point scanning confocal microscopes provide a high contrast, sharp image right out of the box with no additional image processing required. So using them can save quite a lot of time and uncertainty introduced by additional image processing such as deconvolution. In addition, technology such as the AriScan detection system can further enhance the resolution in both thin and thick specimens to levels below the theoretical limit of the light microscope. Entire microscopy courses are dedicated to these questions and the staff of the OIVM Corps would be more than happy to discuss the particulars of your experiment to help guide your decision. All you have to do is ask. To close this discussion, please ask yourself the following questions before jumping into using a confocal microscope. The first is what kind of specimen am I going to be looking at? Are they tissue sections? Whole mounts? Cell culture? And is it going to benefit from using a confocal microscope? Next is what am I going to want to do with the images once I have them? Obviously images are great and provide a visual account of evidence you wish to present to support your hypothesis. But they are also important because of the fluorescence data contained within them. You are likely going to need to measure something from these images. You need to make a plan for what the analysis will look like before beginning to take tons of data on any microscope. Knowing what image processing tasks you need to perform downstream will help you optimize your acquisitions and save time. So plan ahead. If you have any questions about this technology, or just want to discuss what options you might have for your own imaging experiments, please feel free to contact the OIVM Corps through our website or via direct email. Thank you.